Hi, dear chess friends. Good to have you here. Welcome to this video. Now it's time for us to discuss a very important opening which never really won a spotlight in terms of, you know, the highest popularity. Yet it's a very dangerous practical weapon, the Benoni defense. It normally arises after knight to f6. We are not playing c4 in this repertoire, but for example, after c4, e6, knight c3, c5, black's looking to get a very sharp position of this sort, where, for example, after such moves, we can immediately see that white got an extra pawn in the center, whilst black has an extra pawn on the queen side. And the positions here are going to be very complicated. Generally, white tends to be better, and many players, especially with the classical style, like myself, tend to be very skeptical towards the Benoni in terms of the objecti objective soundness, saying that white's advantage tends to acquire some pretty threatening size. However, the arising positions are very tricky, and actually black could often fish, fish for some, you know, fish in the murky waters, so to speak. So, um, we will cover the Benoni now, not from the perspective of how to get as much of an advantage as possible. Instead, we're going to look at how to deprive black of his main asset he's looking for in the Benoni, of the counterplay. So, uh, we'll divide the Benoni coverage into two principled different parts. First off, black can play in the so-called old Benoni or classical Benoni, where he is gonna, for example, after say knight f6, knight f3, c5, d5, where he's gonna play d6, g6, bishop g7, and he's basically not looking to ever undermine the pawn with e6, at least anytime soon, until he develops castles and so on. This is one path. Another path is to immediately hit the pawn with the movie 6, which is what characterizes the modern version of Benoni. We will start with the old version, and actually we're gonna start with the move pawn to c5 right here. Now, um, what is the idea? Well, black's obviously looking to save a tempo on the move knight f6, which might serve for different purposes. Let's see what they are. Besides that, I, I wanted to make a little joke. I remember reading a book of Dvoretsky, and Dvoretsky played this accelerated Benoni with c5 versus another strong grandmaster. And um, then during the game, he started thinking, as you know, apparently, why I didn't expect what, 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 that this was coming up. Dvoretsky started thinking, and he said, okay, so I know d5, I know dc5, and then he was like, Jesus Christ, what if my opponent goes e4? The thing is, I don't play the Sicilian, and now we have the Sicilian after cd knight f3. <laughs> so, actually, if you are, let's say, a player who is a ready and capable and willing to, for some reason, let's say, switch to the Sicilian from, the, from now on, well, you can. But apparently, this is not what we're looking to do. So d5. And here, one of the very interesting schemes, which is totally independent, which black might look for, is the move pawn to e5. And the point is that after e4, d6, he is going to do the following thing. Well, actually, I would like to make one small point and explain one important detail about what we're gonna do as white. So we could for sure go pawn to c4, but in fact, this move doesn't make sense. Our center is already solid enough, and in fact, it's a lot better to play knight c3. This move does not lose any time, it immediately develops a piece, and actually, what's very important, you're not restricting this bishop, which will actually prove very, very crucial shortly. So, after bishop e7 here, black has a very interesting plan, strategically, it's very principled to go bishop to g5. Why is he willing to do that? Why does he want to move the bishop for a couple of times in the opening? Well, look, so with the moves d c5, d6, and e5, black placed all of his pawns on the dark squares. What does that entail? Now, as a result, his bishop on e7 barely has any bright prospects at all. He is not interested in keeping that bishop. Also, on top of that, white, who has the pawn on d5, can boast of a certain amount of space advantage. Now, when you have the space disadvantage, like black does in this position, it's typically beneficial to trade the pieces. And this case is no exception. So black wants to trade for two reasons. First, lack of space. Secondly, his bishop is not good. 
while the white one is, and this is an even more important reason. Now, white will play knight to f3, stopping the idea of bishop g5. However, black's idea cannot be, you know, rendered pointless immediately, because he's got a very interesting plan to go bishop to g4, intending to take this knight and play bishop g5. For example, if white played, let's say, h3, this plays into black's hands, because after taking, taking bishop g5, black manages to swap two pairs of minor pieces, and as a result, he actually gets a very interesting position where he definitely does have quite a bit of, you know, counterplay. And actually what's interesting is that in the long run, this bishop might become somewhat suspicious looking. As, as you can see, it has been restrained by this pawn on d5 and the other colleague on e4. And in fact, I think this is a fairly decent position for black. Probably objectively speaking, white still keeps the advantage, but I would personally prefer to stay away from it if possible and look for more. So we are gonna continue with the move bishop to b5 check here, a very important move which totally hinders black's development. Now what what do I mean? Well, obviously you're not gonna look you're not gonna look to play bishop d7 as black after you played bishop g4, would you? I mean that would be totally dumb. Uh, black's not looking to go king f8, I guess, even though this is a possible move, but you're not really looking to do that for that simple reason that after, well, now you're not going to be able to castle, you'll, you know, have to lose a lot of time to arrange the pieces. And finally, black has to play knight d7, right? Now, we are going to play h3, forcing the bishop to make a decision. Of course, he takes, takes, and here it's very important that even though it seems we are allowing for black strategic dream, which is to play bishop to g5, this in fact is not the case, because if black plays bishop g5, white is able to win the game on the spot. How? Okay, I hope you took a little bit of time to think. Again, we don't want to be guessing the moves, we don't want to be, you know, blindly following what the presenter has been telling. We want to think and we want to improve our chess ability in the process. So the problem here is that white can take this knight. And the queen proves a little overloaded for that reason that it's got to protect the bishop and if it takes, well, of course, white just wins a piece in the game. And instead, if black plays takes with the king, well, I mean, the move itself does not really, you know, withstand any criticism. Now, white could take this pawn, but it's even cleaner to give a check and then simply pick the bishop and white's a piece up and the game is over. So, um... Black will play a6 perhaps in this position, and now we can simply take on d7. And after the queen takes on d7, again, black has been deprived of bishop to g5. This is very important. Now, white can black would like perhaps to go b5 at some point, so we'll simply play a4. And after knight f6, one game that I really like, which I think really showed, you know, a pretty exemplary way for white to handle this position, so a5. Squeezing the black queen side even more. Now, if black ever wants to move his b-pawn, this will come at the expense of the worsened pawn structure. And after castling, castling, queen to d8, white simply continued with bishop d2. Now, why this move? Well, it might look weird, but the idea will actually be revealed shortly. So, in fact, the square on b6 is a very lovely spot for the white knight to come to, but if you were to play knight a4, you can hang this pawn. And this is not going to look good. You don't want to blunder stuff, right? So with the move bishop d2, it simply protected this little guy on a5 and intended prepared knight a4, knight b6. Now black played knight d7, possibly making the room for f5, possibly looking to play bishop f6 or bishop g5. So white stopped bishop g5 with queen g3. Bishop f6, and here the knight came around. c4, another nice move. Now white it makes sense for white to play this way. And here, generally speaking, let's think what white's idea will be. What is white playing for in a position of this sort? What do you guys think? Okay, so what white wants to do, in fact, is to push b4. And in fact, he could, do the, he could do this immediately, perhaps, but then, well, it might entail losing this pawn or something. So first, white prepared this, and I think rook b1 would have been a nice move. Keeping this rook on the a-file, perhaps we could use it later, and preparing b4. And after takes, takes, 
Well, white will double up and then the pawn on b7 will be terribly weak and white could try to push c5 as well. And actually white could possibly, well, it's not really going to happen because of this guy on b4, on c4, which white will lose, but white could want to take with the bishop in order to put pressure on the pawn on d6. That would have been very sensible as well. So this would have made perfect sense, I think, but white played queen e3 and waited a little bit, which I think was not really needed. And at this point, Black actually kind of went a little too far with his pieces. He had to try to stop it with, you know, some moves like, say, maybe f4, maybe bishop f6. In fact, I don't really think the bishop belongs here. It should be on e7 to protect this pawn. So Black went a little too far, and after the simple bc5 takes, 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 and then queen to b3, white's position was simply crushing. And I need to say that um, the Black player, a very famous grandmaster, Ivan, uh, actually... Well, a fairly famous player, not a very famous player, maybe, but I mean, I just know his games pretty well. The uh, Grandmaster Ivanovich has uh, managed to show very good defensive technique, and probably, if we're being honest, this technique also got combined with a fair amount of luck, because here Black's position was already dead lost. However, you know, instead of simply, say, pushing the deep on, White started playing a little bit indecisively, and he definitely was winning for many, many more moves from now on, but eventually Black defended carefully and White was not decisive enough to ever consider possibly moves like G3 followed by F4 and so on, and long story short, Black managed to escape. However, I definitely think that, you know, the rising position is clearly super beneficial for white, even if we were not to use such drastic evaluations as totally winning. White clearly outplayed the opponent and was enjoying very comfortable play during the entire lifespan of this battle, and I definitely think this is something we should be looking for. So this is our solution to the move d4, c5 right away. Now, we're gonna move on to knight f6. And after knight f3, c5, d5, we need to look at a bunch of choices that Black's got. So here, and actually it's important to mention that the position we're going to see after d6, knight c3, g6, can also actually be reached via a slightly different move order, which is, you know, d4, c5. And here, instead of e5, of course, Black can just go knight f6. And now a very important thing is that because our pawn on c2 is on c2, we can actually take advantage of this and simply play knight to c3. Again, there's no need to make this pawn move, and it's important to instead develop rapidly and possibly keep the, uh, the possibility of giving a check. So here, one unfortunate thing for black is that after, say, g6, e4, well, he can't really play bishop g7 because e5 is going to be pretty much it. This will be pretty sad for black, I would say. So he's got to play d6 at some point, which allows for our key goals is check on b5. So the game, so d6, and after e4, g6, knight to f3, bishop g7, white played bishop b5 check. I actually wanted to mention too, via such move order, we could play f4 here as well, which is very strong. However, the reason why I'm not showing this is because black can start with um, d4, knight f6, and after knight to f3, c5, d5, g6, of course, we cannot play f4 anymore via this move order, so it makes no sense to look at this move, right? So, um, the position so the plan with knight f3, and it's a little less aggressive than the plan with f4, but it's still very solid and good. Check. And now let's discuss what are the details and nuances and ideas behind this check, which is one, arguably, of the key ideas in those Benoni positions for the white uh, color. And actually, oftentimes, it's also used in the reversed Benoni, after, say, knight f3, d5, c4, d4, where black later gives the same check on b4. So what's happening here? Well... For one, if we were to just develop, let's think after moves like this, what Black's ideas would look like. So, first of all, Black's got a little less space, right? Actually, significantly less space. So, he would be interested in trading pieces. How is that going to happen? He might want to go bishop g4 and swap the bishop off for our knight. That's one thing. Then, he would like to push b5. However, it's not easy to achieve with the move a6, because after a4, well, this is not happening, this is just a pipe dream. So, Black's got to do something else and prepare this move in a different manner. So, the fashion he'll do it in is knight a6, typically, followed by knight c7, rook b8, and then b5. The knight's placed very well on c7. But still, he cherishes the dream of playing bishop g4 and trading this guy off. 
Now, and final idea for black here could be to undermine the center with e6. In my opinion, black will be much better off to play, if, if he played e6, so let's say on move 2 or on move 3, um, doing it a lot faster and depriving white of some options, but still that could be the plan, right? So now let's think why we're giving this check. Well, as we know, black wants to go bishop g4. So if he goes knight bd7, this would probably be the most kind of, you know, committal and actually, uh, well, weakening and, you know, well, it, it would be the move that would deprive black of most options and make his life as difficult as it gets. So here are the reasons. Well, now black wants to play 6 and then b5 after we move the bishop, so we play a4. And then after black, for example, castles, we can just castle to. And here is the difference. Here is what happened. So we've made this move bishop b5 check, which you might argue is not particularly needed, but we forced the black knight to d7. As a result, we've achieved a huge number of things. For one, if black ever wants to go e6, well, guess what? After taking and queen d6, black's gonna lose material. So that plan has been cancelled out completely. Then, if black wants to play knight a6, knight c7, guess what? The knight's already somewhere else. That plan has been cancelled out totally as well. And finally, if black wants to play bishop g4, well, it's only the knights that can jump over some other pieces. The bishop cannot do that. So white has deprived the opponent of all of his ideas. Every single idea black had has been dealt with. Now, I'm not willing to say white, you know, totally winning or something, but we can just continue as a squeeze with moves like rook e1, h3, bishop f4, possibly prepare e5, possibly play queen d2, possibly look at bishop h6, possibly look to squeeze black on this flank, possibly look to reroute the knight on c4. <laughs> Well, the only thing is when the knight comes to c4, don't blunder a6 when the bishop might get trapped, that's important. So, long story short, white is simply pushing for no counterplay, no counter chances by the opponent. There is no way black can create counterplay. Now, <clears throat> black apparently is not interested in a scenario like this, should he? Should he be? Apparently not. If he goes bishop d7, though, there is another problem. So, of course... Uh, he hasn't committed the knight, but as a result, he hasn't, you know, he, he now is not unable to play bishop to g4. And also, he is unable to play six because of the same issue with the pawn on d6. Now, again, if we retreat, well, black would like to somehow prepare b5 eventually. And possibly, actually, if we retreat, then he could try b5 even here. The point being that even though he hangs this pawn, we are gonna hang this one. So this is no good, not what we want. So we play a4. Now, after the move pawn to a4, Black does not really want anymore to take on b5 because after a b, the weakness on a7 is absolutely horrifying and, well, this is probably not, you know, a game over immediately, the position is going to be super unpleasant. Now, Black would typically continue castling, which is exactly what Bedavsky did in a game versus Kasparov. Yes, our Gary Kasparov will be our um, guide in those positions, which... Clearly, you know, you couldn't pick a better guide. Castling, knight a6. And here, white simply continued the normal calm development with the move rook e1. And after black played, now, black could try knight c7, but in fact, this plan with b5 is not easy to prepare, and white's in fact is a lot faster with his own plan, which is bishop c4 first. Well, now we're supporting this pawn, which will prove important. And if black plays a6, b6, if black played a6, then we could consider a5 actually squeezing his uh, queen side completely. So let's say b6, preparing a6, rook b8, and b5. Well, now white has a very strong push in the center e5. And this, in fact, is one of white's typical ideas. That's exactly where he is stronger, so he should be looking to break through. And after, for example, d5, knight e5, now white might look to come to c6. Now the weakness on e7 has been kind of, you know, exposed. White can play bishop f4 later, queen d2 for example, possibly he can look to double up and hit the pawn on e7, he could maybe even possibly look d6 if the uh, timing is right, but also very likely he's looking to play knight c6 and get a very strong passer and hit the pawn, and in fact black's position is very very bad here. Also white might be even looking to play knight b5 at some point, like let's say if some move like rook c8, then knight b5 could be an idea, hitting this pawn and of course maybe even intending if a6. To come to a7 and to c6. Now both knights are looking at this juicy square. 
And while a7 may not seem to be the most conventional path to get there, well, what the only thing that matters is the final destination, the final execution. So white here is nearly crushing, and black doesn't really get to you know create much of a counterplay. So Bilovsky tried knight to b4, and here Kasparov continued with a simple h3. What he would like to do possibly is to stop not only not only bishop g4, which is obviously desirable to trade this guy on f3, but also knight g4, possibly intending knight e5, as well as intending to open up the bishop. So, um, white played h3, and after e6, bishop f4, e5, white continued bishop g5. Now, this, the structure has changed a lot, but in fact, I think this structure is not very favorable for black in this specific case because he is not ever going to get a counterplay on the king side with this typical h6, g5, f5. And importantly, one of the big reasons why he is not going to do that is because eventually one of black's goal, if he manages to advance the pawns, would be to possibly, let's say, sacrifice a bishop on h3. But unfortunately for him, because the light squared bishops are getting traded, this is not going to happen. So with the trade of the light squared bishops, white also manages to greatly decrease black's potential on the king side. Now, bishop c8 is what black did, trying to keep this bishop, but then white continued knight d2, black tried his play, and here um, black's not really capable of doing much with f5, because white can always take, and then use the square on e4 for his knight. So, black continued g4, but then white simply took knight g4 f3, and it transpired that the only side that now has the weaknesses on the king side is black. Now the square on f5 is weak, now there is a pin, now possibly the pawn on h6 is weak, and so on and so forth. And after some, to be honest, not such sophisticated maneuvering, white managed to take full advantage of the weakened squares such as f5 later, he found another nice way to increase the pressure, and soon the game was totally over. How did white finish black off here? And it's not a tactical blow, in fact, it's a very slow move that just takes advantage of the weaknesses black has and improves our position even more. How can we improve some of our pieces in a decisive manner at this point? Okay, I hope you did take some time to think. So, in fact, there is an open h file, and it makes perfect sense to go king f2. Now rook h1 is coming, and black's not going to be able to hold on to all of this. He actually tried, he took, took knight f4, he played knight to h3 check, but then after king e2, it transpired the king is perfectly safe, rook h1 is coming, and, well, the knight's not going to be trapped, but the pawn on h6 will be lost, and the position will be absolutely hopeless so black resigned in a couple of moves in my opinion this was an absolutely gorgeous strategic achievement by gary kasparov who was a very young player back in the day he was 20 years old and he was already obviously one of the best players in the world um as you can see even such a strong opponent as bedavsky did not manage to actually create any counterplay and get any chances Apparently, this is exactly what we are looking for. I'm not looking to win the game immediately. I'm not hoping to trap the opponent into something, you know, decisive right away. But I am really hoping, I'm very hopeful to create a situation of this sort, which you saw in this game, where the opponent will be suffering, where he'll be struggling to get any counterplay, any activity, any threats, and he won't be ever able to get out of the back ranks. And this is exactly what happened. Now, moving on, another game that we need to look at in this position after the bishop b5 check, so knight fd7. In fact, while this might seem to be a very counterintuitive move, this is a very savvy, a very careful reply. Uh, the thing is that now black wants to keep this knight on a6 and c7, and hopefully he's hoping not to trade the bishop and possibly actually to come to g4 later. I mean, he wants to trade the bishop, but for a knight and not for this bishop. And also he is opening up the bishop on g7. So here again, it's important that we don't want to, let's say, castle, because after a6, black is going to get b5 in. This is no, no good. So we continue with a4, and after 
knight a6, white simply castled, castled, and here follows the same very plan. We have restrained the opponent on one flank, and now it's time to play ourselves on a different part of the board. White continued with the move rook e1, with the move bishop f1, bishop f4. Guess what's happening? We are preparing e5. So now followed another preparatory move. e5 is actually on cards very soon. Black played rook b8, and here I think that the plan with c5 would have been sensible, but there is also a different plan here. So basically black's only good piece in this position is the bishop on g7. And while you might think that trading is not good for white because he's got more space, and in fact a consideration of this sort is very sensible, you, I'm definitely praising you if you did think about this and if you just, you know, objected to me mentally, hey, why are you about to suggest the bishop trade if, you know, we, we want to keep the pieces? Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, black's looking to get some counterplay and the bishop could really help. But once you trade this bishop, black would be totally deprived of all the active pieces. And obviously, um, oftentimes it's good to trade some piece, even if it's not better than its our counterpart on our side, if in return we manage to keep all the opponent's other pieces passive. So here what white did was bishop h6 and after knight e5 white took, black took and now we have the structure where the black e pawns are double. In fact the structure is not just you know one-sidedly bad because black can for example try to reroute the knight to d6. However, however, white has a bunch of advantages as well that we are going to see shortly. For example, black cannot easily play f5 because then there will be a lot of weaknesses over the e-file. So black here, white here continued with the move knight d1, queen d6, and now white took, took and improved the knight with knight e3. Now white might be looking to play on the queen side with moves like maybe a5 or maybe c3 and then b4. The knight could go to c4 in order to attack the queen as well as the pawn on e5. And in fact, black needs to be very careful. Now, if black made some random moves, then actually he could run into the following issue. Knight c4, the queen now has to go to f6 or else this guy on e5 will be lost. And after queen c3, white is simply winning the pawn and the game's going to be over shortly. Or, I mean, okay, you know, arguably you can play, it's not a mate, but you don't want to be a central pawn down for no compensation. So black played b5, stopping this knight c4. But then after taking, taking rook a7, white was the one to benefit from the newly open a file. And after bishop d7, queen to c3, pawn to f6, pawn to b4, white started looking for, for you know, activity on the queen side. Now black perhaps had to play c4, which makes sense in a way because it shuts down the bishop and restrains the knight. However, after say rook a1, I think it's white who is calling the shot because black has no counterplay on the king side. And obviously white's activity on the queen side does count for something later. Let's say white could maybe try to uh, improve this bishop a little bit or maybe even trade it down like this or possibly do something like h4, maybe h5 or maybe say g3, h4, king h2, bishop h3 trade. Maybe the rook can actually be routed somewhere to attack over here. Maybe black could, uh, white could try somehow to say hit this pawn or somehow try to hit this knight. The black queen cannot move because the knight will be lost. The knight doesn't have many moves. And while this could still be arguably, you know, a reasonably doable position for black, he could defend. I think he, he is clearly suffering. But he had to do this because after what black did with the move knight a6, he was suddenly just dead, lost. For actually for a couple of reasons. How will we continue here as white to win pretty much or to get a winning advantage? Okay, I hope you took a little bit of time. So what we're gonna do here is, actually there are a couple of choices. One, I think which is very strong is queen a1, but this move isn't very obvious. So I'm not sure if I'll be recommending it as, as, my, as my first choice, even though perhaps this is the best one. So here if black takes the three pawns and after c3 he regrets it immediately, the knight is trapped. If black chooses to, let's say, play knight c7, then we can go queen a5. Now the, the pressure on the knight is becoming pretty much unbearable. And after, say, rook c8, white can win in an absolutely gorgeous manner, which is knight c4 attacking the queen. And after bc, bc, suddenly the queen is trapped. But okay, guys, objectively speaking, I 
found this line with the help of the engine as I was analyzing the game. And objectively speaking, I would personally perhaps have preferred what uh, the white player actually went for, but I did want to share this beauty with you because I think it's important to be honest. It's important to understand what kind of moves a human being can easily find and what kind of moves are, you know, pretty much hidden and difficult and maybe even are not needed. But at the same time, well, if the computer is such a good assistant, why not enjoy, you know, a little bit of this beauty and this sort of dive in chess? Why not, right? It's very beautiful. So White continued in a very natural way to me. He sacrificed an exchange and then took. The thing is now this pawn on c6 is going on c5 is gonna move, is gonna be super strong, and the pawn on b5 is the weakness. White can hit it with rook b1, queen b4, maybe c4, take advantage of the pins. So here black played b4, hitting our queen and losing uh, hanging his own one. White took, black took, and there followed c6. And white managed to tear apart and completely extinguish any potential counterplay black could have. And in fact, in a position like this, of course, black has this weakness on e5, black has this weakness on c3, uh, the weaknesses on the seventh rank will tell the c pawn is super strong. If this pawn got lost somehow, then the, of course, two past pawns will easily queen. And very soon the game actually was finished. Black won king f6, which he had to do. Then white closed the king side in order not to let the black rooks have too, too much fun, too many open files. And pretty soon he managed to simply queen all of his stuff over the last rank. Black played rook h8 and there followed another nice move, rook b8. Rook b7, here white took, took, knight b6. The black rook can never come in. And after king g7, bishop b5, white played king f2. And in this position, what is a little surprising, black chose to resign. I'm not sure, maybe he got flagged, maybe he chose to resign, but apparently what he figured is that white was just looking to come over with the king. And later white could even start coming all the way over in, the, in order to eventually take and play king g7. And in fact, actually I think white had misplayed the position a little bit during the last moves, and here it's not actually easy for him to win, because what's important is that while he black cannot ever take the pawn because of knight c8, he will be able to do so because after when the king eventually crosses the third rank, this will come with a check. And black might even look to, you know, sacrifice the bishop for a pawn, like bishop b7, let white queen. And in fact, it would not have been easy at all to win this position. I'm not sure if white is even, you know, objectively speaking, better. I mean, of course, he is the one pushing, he is the one who can choose what to do. But clearly, black had rushed with the decision. I think white would have been actually probably just winning here if he played d6. And then after, say, e d6, knight d6, well, white's actually queening a lot of stuff. But apparently white, well, this move rook b8 is pretty good, but here, I guess white had to, in this position, I think white had to do, do things in a slightly different way. Like, for example, he could have first chosen to, let's say, play maybe at some point um, bishop f1, protecting the pawn, and then move the king or something. Well, I mean, white didn't spoil anything. He could still return to a plan where he would defend the pawn and so on. But yeah, I mean, objectively speaking, I feel like he has wasted his advantage a little bit. But what ended up happening is that why just won after this move? I have no clue how this happened. Maybe disbelief in Black's, you know, forces and resignation. Maybe flagging. Maybe whatever else. Had to catch the train. I don't know. Let's make some funny versions, but assumptions. But okay, for us it doesn't matter because the rest of the game White played. I mean, the beginning of the game, the middle game, White played extremely, extremely well. So, as a conclusion, I would like to say is that the Benoni where black continues um, in the slow manner with c5, d6, knight f6, and so on, both with c5 on move 1, um, trying this approach with bishop e7, bishop g5, and where he plays the classical d6, knight f6, g6, do not tend to work very well. And white does not really need to know that much. I think his two biggest ideas include, first of all, playing knight c3 instead of the natural c4, and secondly, giving the check on b5 in order to totally disrupt black's development and all of black's ideas related with the counterplay thanks to bishop g4, thanks to knight a6, c7, and so on and so forth. If you know that, you will be doing just great. Now, we are ready to meet the slow Benoni, and it's time for us to look at the... Um, so to speak, accelerated or modern Benoni, which arises after knight f6, c5, d5, and here e6. And we are going to do that in the next clip. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you then. Take care.